Okay, I think uh, we can make a start. Uh, my lecture today will be about deformation and in particular homogeneous deformation. So I'll explain what that means. But the purpose of uh, studying about this is that we often uh, manipulate materials. So for example, when you're doing rolling, you would like to know what the shape of the grain after rolling is in a quantitative way or a forging operation or wire drawing operation how does that change the amount of surface uh, interface area you have per unit volume, the amount of grain edge per unit volume, and so on. And in the context of phase transformations, uh, all transformations which do not involve diffusion happen by a deformation of the parent into the product. And we need to understand that in order to explain the structures that we observe and to control the structures that we observe. So there's a little bit of mathematics involved, but I'm going to explain it gently. And as usual, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. I'll show you some applications as well. So I'm going to start off with a diagram that you're very familiar with. And that is uh, two unit cells of austenite drawn next to each other. So these are the cubic F lattices of austenite, two unit cells drawn next to each other. Inside that, I can identify another unit cell of austenite, which is body-centered tetragonal. And if I compress this red cell along the z-axis and uniformly expand along the x and y-axis, then I end up with a body-centered cubic cell of ferrite. Now, these are called the principal distortions. I'll explain the term principal later. But basically, the deformation along here involves a compression. And the final length of this vector here is the lattice parameter of the ferrite. And its initial length was the lattice parameter of the austenite along the z direction. So the ratio of the final to the initial length is called the distortion along that axis. Okay? It's different from a strain because a strain is a difference in, the, a difference in the length before and after. This is a distortion because it's the ratio of the final to the initial length. Okay? So eta 3 here is the distortion along this direction. Now in this uh, orientation, we have a uniform expansion. Okay. The initial uh, length over here is root 2 a gamma divided by 2, okay. because this length here is root 2 into a gamma. So if I have root 2 into a gamma divided by 2, then it's a gamma upon root 2. And the final length here will be the lattice parameter of ferrite. So we have a alpha into a divided by a gamma over root 2. So the distortion along this direction or this direction involves an expansion because root 2 a alpha is greater than a gamma. Okay? So these are called the principal def uh, distortions. Uh, the reason is that the orientation of this axis is not changed by the deformation. If I compress it, then the z-axis of the ferrite is parallel to the z-axis of the austenite. Similarly, the orientation along here is not changed by the expansion. In general, a vector will not only be stretched, but it will also be rotated. So those uh, vectors are not principal directions for the deformation. Okay? So these are the principal distortions involved in the Bain strain which changes the austenite into the ferrite lattice. Now, I want to represent this deformation using a matrix. Uh, what I want to point out to you first is the difference between a coordinate transformation matrix and a deformation matrix. So, this is a deformation matrix, and notice that the basis symbol on both sides is identical, because we are defining the deformation with respect to a coordinate system. We are not changing the coordinate system. So here is a vector u. This is a coordinate transformation matrix. 
because I want to find its components in the A basis or in the B basis. The vector is unchanged by the coordinate transformation. It's pointing in the same direction and has the same length. In the case of a deformation, this is the initial vector u, and in general, the final vector v will be changed both in orientation and in length. Okay, so that's the difference between a deformation and a coordinate transformation, that here we are actually changing the vector. The physical quantity is being altered, the coordinate axes are the same for both u and v. Okay? Now the reason why we need to use uh, deformation matrices uh, which have the distortions eta1, eta2, eta3, instead of a strain tensor, is that strain tensors are only valid for very small deformations. Yeah, so if you look at your strain tensor with you know, epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 1, 2 and so on, those are very small quantities, right? Yeah, they are very small quantities and therefore uh, it's basically an approximation to deformation. Those approximations are not important when your strains are very small. Here we are going to deal with large deformations. You know, in the Bain strain itself, the compression is very large. It's about 11% along the z-axis. You cannot use the approximations that go into strain tensors for deformation matrices. Okay, so here is our body-centered tetragonal cell of austenite before the Bain strain, and this is the cubic cell we obtain after the Bain strain. So here we have a uniform expansion in the basal plane here and a large contraction along the z-axis. Okay. So this is now a change in structure. Once you've applied this deformation, the structure is no longer the same. You cannot express the body-centered cubic cell in terms of a face-centered cubic unit cell because the symmetry has changed by applying this deformation. And I'm just repeating here the principal uh, distortions. In order to define the deformation matrix, all I have to do is express what happens to the basis vectors of the parent, the basis vectors of the parent, as a consequence of the deformation. So if I look at this z-axis, what was 0, 0, 1 becomes 0, 0, eta 3. Okay? That's the new vector resulting from the deformation <coughs> of 0, 0, 1 of the red cell. Similarly, if I look along the 1, 0, 0 of the red cell, after deformation it becomes eta 1, 0, 0, and this becomes eta 2, 0, 0 as a consequence of the deformation. So, here we are again summarizing what I said. 1, 0, 0 becomes eta 1, 0, 0. 0, 1, 0 becomes 0, eta 2, 0. And eta 2 happens to be the same as eta 1 in this case. And the final basis vector, 0, 0, 1 of the red cell becomes 0, 0, eta 3. So just as we wrote down the coordinate transformation matrix uh, in a previous lecture, we can write a deformation matrix as follows. So if I multiply this, if I multiply 0, 0, 1 by this, I will get eta 1, uh, sorry, if I multiply 1, 0, 0 by this, I will get eta 1, 0, 0. If I multiply 0, 1, 0, I will get this. And similarly, if I multiply the z-axis by the deformation matrix, I will get this. So I've defined the deformation matrix exactly as we did with the coordinate transformation matrix. Now I can look at any vector multiplied by ASA and I will get what happens to that vector as a consequence of the transformation. Where will it point and what will be its magnitude? Now you'll see that this is very relevant in a, another lecture. You will see that it's very relevant when you look at trip steels or twip steels where the transformation actually causes, uh, transformation causes a deformation or a mechanical twinning operation causes a deformation. Okay, now the 
matrix that we derived here, you can see it's symmetrical, okay, and all these components here are zero because the matrix itself is referred to the principal axes of the deformation. The principal axes are axes which are not rotated by the deformation. And the zero, zero, 001 direction is not rotated and neither are the 100 zero, zero, or 010 zero, zero direction. So those axes are actually the principal axes of that deformation. They are not rotated by the deformation and therefore we have what's called a pure strain with a symmetrical matrix and because it's referred to the principal axes, all the other components are zero. Yeah. Those axes are not rotated. And the volume change due to that deformation is given by the determinant of that matrix, which in this case happens to be just the product of eta 1, eta 2 and eta 3. And do you know what that volume change would be roughly for the austenite to ferrite transformation? Approximately? About 3%. Okay? Now, there's a small mistake here. This is not a volume change, it's the ratio of the volumes of the two unit cells. Okay? Ratio of the volume of the unit cell of austenite, which is body centered tetragonal, and the unit cell of ferrite. Okay, so uh, there's our matrix. It's symmetrical because it's referred to the principal axes and it's a pure deformation because it simply involves contraction and expansion along the principal axes. I can represent this deformation slightly differently. Uh, so here is the real representation. If I now take my austenite and make it a sphere in three dimensions, then in the xy plane, as a consequence of this deformation, the sphere will become, uh, the circle will become a bigger circle. So this is the xy plane here, and this is the initial circle, the cross section of the sphere on the xy plane, and as a consequence of deformation, it becomes a larger circle, right? If I now look at the X, Z plane. So this is X and this is Z and along Z we have a compression. Then this circle becomes an ellipsoid. Yeah? Because the Bain strain changes the sphere into an ellipsoid. It's like an M&M. &M. Yeah? You know M&M, &M, the chocolate? Is everyone familiar with M&M? &M? Yeah? So that used to be a sphere and when you do the Bain strain on it, it becomes an ellipsoid of revolution about Z. So this circle changes into this ellipsoid. Now notice this is a very important diagram because we are going to prove that it's impossible to get a coherent interface between austenite and ferrite. Okay? Very, very simple proof that you can never get a coherent interface between austenite and ferrite. Coherent means perfect matching. Okay? Uh, and it independent of size. I'm not talking about forced coherency. You know, when a particle is small, it might have forced coherency with elastic strains around it, but you can never get perfect matching between austenite and ferrite. And we'll prove this right now. So, in this plane, there's no vector which is left undeformed, right? Every vector is extended. So, you cannot have any coherency in that plane. Over here, you can see there are two vectors, okay, which are undistorted. That means their lengths are not changed. This one, AB, and AB, after deformation, it becomes AB dashed. So its length is not changed. Similarly, CD, uh, and its length is not changed as a consequence of the deformation. But they are not coherent because the vector after deformation is rotated, right? So they're not matching perfectly because you've got a rotation. Yes, so I can, I can create an interface by taking a single crystal and rotating one half with respect to the other. That doesn't give me coherency, right? So these lines are not going to 
give us coherent lines. They are, although they are not distorted, they are rotated. So there is no line which is left undistorted and unrotated by the Bain strain. Okay. So we say that there is no invariant line. Okay. An invariant line is a line which is unrotated and undistorted. If you have two non-parallel invariant lines, then you can find a coherent plane. Because a plane is defined by two vectors, right? If both of those vectors, non-collinear vectors, yeah, are undistorted and unrotated, then you have a fully coherent interface. Here, I cannot find in any plane a set of lines two lines, a pair of lines, which are invariant. So it's impossible to produce a coherent interface. Now supposing that I do my Bain strain and then I rotate the ferrite with respect to the austenite. Okay, so I add another deformation which doesn't uh, alter any length, but it rotates the crystal. And here is one such rotation where I've added a rotation to the Bain strain so that one of these lines becomes coincident with the other. Okay? Then I can produce one invariant line. So the combination of a Bain strain and a rigid body rotation can lead to coherency along one direction between austenite and ferrite, but there is no rotation which will make two lines coincident. Therefore, this is absolute proof that you cannot get a coherent interface between austenite and ferrite. It's impossible. Okay? The best you can do is you can get fit along one single line. Now, notice one more thing. There is an orientation relationship between austenite and ferrite here, right? The cells are related to each other. And I think the air conditioning is on in this room, so I will put my jacket on. That orientation relationship says that 100 zero zero of austenite uh, in the body-centered tetragonal cell okay, is the same as 100, zero zero, is parallel to 100 zero zero of ferrite. And if we were looking at the cubic cell, that would be a 110 zero direction of austenite parallel to a 100. Zero of ferrite. So let me go back to the cubic cell. Yeah, you can see that the uh, 1 bar 1 0 direction of austenite would be exactly parallel to 1 0 0 of ferrite and the 1 1 0 of austenite would be parallel to a sorry, yeah, 1 1 0 of austenite would be parallel to 0 1 0 of ferrite and the z-axis are both parallel. So the Bain strain implies that that is the orientation relationship you will get between austenite, austenite and ferrite. Now, is that what we observe? Do you observe that 0, 0, 001 of austenite is exactly parallel to 0, 0, 001 of ferrite? And similarly for these directions, can somebody tell me? What is the common orientation relationship we observe between austenite and ferrite? Yeah. We did this in the last lecture, so it should be there in front of you. Kojimo Sachs type, where you know you have the close back planes parallel and close back directions within those planes parallel. This is not what we observe. Okay. So when we say that the transformation happens by the Bain strain, that isn't strictly correct. You have to have an additional rigid body rotation which predicts exactly the orientation relationship that you observe experimentally. Because the crystals go to the trouble of getting matching along one line. Okay. So if you do the Bain strain, which is very simple, you know the distortions, yeah, you know the lattice parameter of austenite, ferrite. And then you find a rotation 
which will produce one coherent line between the osnite and ferrite that exactly predicts the orientation relationship. Okay. So what you observe as the orientation relationship is exactly because of the need to produce an invariant line and therefore reduce the interfacial energy between osnite and ferrite and because the activation energy for nucleation varies with the cube of the interfacial energy you need that coherency when the particle is small. Okay. So it's very very simple ideas. You can predict the orientation relationship between osnite and ferrite, between copper and chromium precipitates because there's body-centered cubic FCC and so on. Okay. Everyone absolutely ecstatic about that result? You can totally explain the orientation relationships that you observe. Okay, um, now in the case of the face-centered cubic to body-centered cubic transformation, you cannot produce coherency. How about between face-centered cubic and hexagonal closed packed? Can you get a fully coherent interface? Yeah. Which interface plane would that be? Yeah. Because, you know, in the uh, face centered cubic, you have closed back planes which are stacked A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, right? In HCP, you have closed back planes which are stacked A, B, A, B, A, B. So if you simply shift every alternate plane in the austenite, on, on the 111 plane to another stacking position, then you will go from austenite to hexagonal closed back. That means that there is no change in the structure of the plane. It's simply shifting it by a partial, uh, by, uh, not by a lattice vector. Okay? Because if you just change by a lattice vector, you don't change anything. So it's actually A by 6, 112 displacement in the 111 plane. So we know that it's possible to produce a fully coherent interface between uh, austenite and epsilon martensite. And the same uh, sort of analysis that we've done for FCC to BCC will show you that you can indeed find a coherent line in the XY plane. Okay? And then you simply add a rigid body rotation about the y2 axis here so that one more line comes into coincidence and you've got two lines which are fully coherent invariant lines and if you can get two lines then you've got an invariant plane and in this case it's the 111 plane of austenite parallel to the 0001 plane of hexagonal closed pact okay so i'm not going to go into the deformation here but you can find it in the book that I uh, said you could download, The Geometry of Crystals, okay? Right, what's next? Okay, so just to remind you, um, we, we have defined a deformation matrix with respect to a particular coordinate system. In the case of the Bain strain, it was the coordinate system of the austenite. But supposing I now want to define that deformation with respect to another coordinate system, you know, the rolling direction, normal direction, and transverse direction, for example, then I need to transform that deformation matrix into another coordinate system. Okay? So this is the operation I want to show you now. We have a deformation in which an initial vector u changes into a vector v in the coordinate system A. I'm not changing the nature of the deformation, but I now want to define it with respect to another coordinate system B. Yeah? Can you see that? So if I have a matrix A S A here, I want to find the matrix B S B. Okay? And that is called a similarity transformation. That means, you know, we have the same deformation, but in a different coordinate system. Okay, so here's our initial vector u, written as a column vector. And this is our deformation matrix. 
And this is what happens when the deformation operates on the vector u. And the meaning of a homogeneous deformation is that it leaves points which are initially in a line still in a line after deformation. The line may be rotated, stretched, but the points will still be in a line. And similarly, if you have two lines which lie in a plane, then after deformation, those two lines will also lie in the deformed plane. Okay? That's the meaning of a homogeneous deformation. Now, slip is not a homogeneous deformation because, you know, if I have a line going through the slip plane and I displace the plane above it, then you'll get a step in that line. Okay? Macroscopically, it's homogeneous, but not microscopically. But the Bain strain we were talking about is a homogeneous deformation which leaves points which are originally in a line collinear and lines originally in a plane coplanar. So, the direction u will change into a direction v as a consequence of the deformation and a plane normal h will change into a plane normal k and if the direction u lies in the plane h then u dot h is zero and it follows by the definition of a homogeneous deformation that v dot k will also be zero because v will lie in the plane k. Yeah. That's simply the meaning of a homogeneous deformation everything is deformed uniformly. Okay. In terms of our notation here, um, h dot u will be equal to k dot v. Now remember, just to remind you, that to take a dot product, we express one vector in the reciprocal lattice and the other vector in real space. So this represents the dot product between h and u. Okay? and A star is the reciprocal basis of A. Do you remember that? Because I want to deal with this quite generally, not restricted to cubic or, or orthogonal systems. Yeah. And taking dot products like this makes it valid for any symmetry. Okay. So here, it's a dot product between uh, H, which is expressed in reciprocal space, uh, its components are expressed with respect to reciprocal space. This is a row vector and this is expressed in real space and it's a column vector. If I take the product of those two, it will be zero and therefore it's also equal to the dot product between k and v. Everyone happy with that? Okay, now I'm going to substitute for this because we know that the vector u comes by the operation of the deformation s on u. So this term here is the same as this. You can see that from here. Okay? I'm just substituting for the vector v by the deformation times the vector u. And of course I can relate uh, h and k uh, through from this equation. I can write this equation simply by multiplying um, by, hang on, how do I do it? Yeah, so I just delete AU on both sides and I've got H A star is equal to K A star into A S A. Okay? So here, it's just deleting AU here. Okay? So this is how, you know, the components of a plane normal would transform through the deformation matrix S. And if I take the inverse of this, then I can write Ka star is equal to H into Asa to the minus 1. I now have to use the symbol minus 1 because, you know, I can't reverse the basis symbols. We are, deformation is with respect to a single coordinate system. Okay. So this is just to show you how real space uh, components transform due to the deformation and how reciprocal space components, uh, plane normals, are affected by the deformation. This is the inverse of the deformation matrix. Okay, uh, here we have our basic equations for u and v. Um, this is the vector u which changes into the vector v by the deformation s. 
I can also do a coordinate transformation of the vector V through AJB into a different coordinate system A. Okay. My ultimate goal is to find BSB given ASA. Uh, the vectors are identical irrespective of the coordinate system, so I don't know this matrix as yet, but if I operated on it by U, I would end up with the vector V. And this is now the coordinate transformation of U into the basis A. So there's nothing new so far. Okay, so here is my vector V in the coordinate system A. So this is the vector V in the coordinate system A. Here is the vector U in the coordinate system A. If I multiply this by this, I get U in the coordinate system A. So V in the coordinate system A multiplied by the deformation here will give me U in the coordinate system A. Everyone happy with that? And we can check again that like basis symbols are next to each other. Okay? Yeah, so there's nothing, nothing new here. It's just this equation where AU is expressed as AJB times BU and AV is expressed as AJB times BV. Okay? Right. If I now multiply throughout by the inverse of AJB, in other words BJA, then I'm left with the vector V in the coordinate system B and I've multiplied by the inverse of BJA, so I've got that over here. And notice now that this is the vector V in the coordinate system B and this is the vector U in the coordinate system B. So what is this? BSB, okay? So we have the result that the deformation S in the coordinate system B is related to the deformation S in the coordinate system A by pre-multiplying by BJB and its inverse. Yeah. So that's how you change the coordinate system in which you express the deformation. Very, very simple. You don't need to remember anything. As long as you ensure that like basis symbols are next to each other, your equation has to be right. Okay? So th this is a, a powerful result. We've done a transformation of a deformation from one coordinate system to another. Now you'll see why this is important. Because some deformations we can just derive a, co uh, a deformation matrix by inspection because the axes happen to be aligned along certain directions. But in reality, we might want to express the deformation in terms of another frame of reference, and then we just do a similarity transformation if we know how to change the coordinates. Right, so let me show you an example of this. Now, these three deformations here, where the blue is the initial and the black uh, lines are the final after the deformation. All three of these deformations leave this horizontal plane unchanged. Okay, so that's an invariant plane. It's undistorted and unrotated by all of these deformations. This is an example where I apply a, a stress along this direction. The Poisson's ratio is zero. Okay. So I get elongation along here, but nothing on the horizontal plane. So beryllium, for example, is a metal which has a Poisson's ratio of almost zero. So if I stretch it along here, I don't get any thinning along these directions. Okay? So that is basically a uniaxial dilatation, and this is the dilatational strain. This is a, a simple shear. For example, when we twin on a certain plane, it doesn't alter anything on the twin plane. Okay? And this is a shear strain. Here we have a change in volume. Here we do not, because the height of this polygon is the same as the height of this square. Okay? 
So shear doesn't cause a change in volume, whereas this causes a change in volume, uh, which is defined by the term delta. A phase transformation in general involves both a volume change and a shear when it happens by a displacive mechanism. Right? So this is the most general deformation which leaves a plane unchanged. It's an invariant plane strain. This plane is unaffected, but we have a volume change and a shear deformation. Okay. So even for the FCC to HCP transformation, I'll show you in a later lecture, the volumes are not identical. There is a volume change with the FCC to HCP transformation, but the entire volume change is normal to the habit plane of the martensite. Okay. So this is the kind of deformation we are interested in, and these are typical values of the shear strain and the volume change associated with phase transformations in steels. Now, I want to derive the deformation matrices for these operations. So, I'm going to choose some very simple axes. So, I'm going to define my Z axis, Z1 axis on the invariant plane, and the Z3 axis pointing vertically, and Z2 is out of the plane of the board. So, just by looking at this, I could write down the deformation matrix because I want to know what are the components of this vector Z1 which is a unit vector as a consequence of this deformation. So if I call that 1, 0, 0, what happens to that as a consequence of that deformation? It's still 1, 0, 0, isn't it? Similarly, Z2 which is pointing out of the plane of the board is also not going to be affected, so it's 0, 1, 0. And how about Z3? Zero, zero? That's it, zero, zero, one plus delta. So my deformation matrix is straightforward. This is unaffected, this is unaffected, and this is zero, zero, one plus delta. Okay. So by choosing these coordinates, I can immediately by inspection find what it is. But notice that if this was a real uh, phase transformation, this plane might be something strange. So these may not correspond to the crystallographic axis, but by deriving this, I can then use a coordinate transformation matrix to change it into the crystallographic axis. Okay. So that's the advantage of knowing how to do the similarity transformation. How about this? What will be the deformation matrix for this? Again, this is not going to be changed. And this is not going to be changed. But how about this one here? It becomes this vector. What are its components? Along the x-axis, it has a component, which is what? Along this axis, yeah? So, here? Yeah. Somebody said something louder. Go on, don't worry, just tell me. What is the component of this vector along this axis? S, that's correct. It's this, this little bit here, okay? And along the Y2 axis, it's, uh, it's nothing. And along this axis, it's one, right? Its height is not changed. So our deformation matrix for that is simply S01 for this vector. Okay? It's acquired a component along the horizontal axis here. Everyone happy with that? Now for this case, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, the component, in addition to the acquiring a component in the shear direction, you've got to change the length here to 1 plus delta. Okay? So effectively, this matrix, you see this deformation is a combination of these two. So this matrix is effectively a combination of this one and this one. Okay? So we end up with S0, 1 plus delta. 
So by choosing the right coordinate axes, you can derive the deformation matrix simply by inspection. Yeah, everyone happy with that? Right, so then I want to transform it into another coordinate system. So I've got my uh, deformation matrix for an invariant plane strain where now the displacement vector has a magnitude m which is a combination of a shear strain and a dilatational strain. If I want to express it in an arbitrary alternative coordinate system, I just do a similarity transformation. And we know how to find this. Yeah? We know how the z axes are related to say the crystallographic axis because z1 might be the shear direction which is 110. Z2 might be you know the 111 direction. So we derive the coordinate transformation matrix in the normal way, do a similarity transformation and I can get my deformation matrix in the crystallographic frame. And I said to you that we can make x anything we want. If you do that, this is the general form of the matrix expressed here, where d1, d2, and d3 are the components of a unit vector along the displacement direction. And p1, p2, and p3 are the components of the plane normal, a unit plane normal and m is the magnitude of the displacement. So this represents all invariant plane strains. If you know the displacement direction and if you know the plane on which that displacement happens and m is the magnitude of the deformation, you can derive any invariant plane strain in whatever axis you've chosen. So supposing d1, d2, d3 correspond to the 1, 1, 2 direction in FCC, then you express that as a unit vector and you've got d1, d2, d3. And supposing the plane is 1 on 1, you express that as a unit plane normal and put p1, p2, p3 and m is the magnitude of the displacement. You've got your deformation matrix, okay? And that's derived simply by taking a, this matrix here and expressing it in an arbitrary coordinate system with D1, D2, D3, and P1, P2, P3 could be anything, okay? So we've got D1, D2, D3, which uh, might be parallel to this Z1. P1, P2, P3 parallel to Z3. And then, of course, we can find a third one by taking the cross product between D and P. And therefore, you've got your coordinate transformation matrix. You've got 0, 0, 001 parallel to D1, D2, D3. Uh, 0, 0, uh, sorry, 100 zero, zero parallel to D1, D2, D3. 0, 0, 001 parallel to P1, P2, P3. And a third one by cross product. Therefore, you can write your coordinate transformation matrix. Everyone happy with that? There's a lot, lot to absorb, but it's not as difficult as you think. It's just new, right? Now, this is simply saying that the magnitude of D is 1 in this equation here, okay? Because if I take a dot product of D with D, then I should get a 1. And similarly, the plane normal is expressed as a unit plane normal. So this is the dot product between B and B. Now, I can write this equation more economically as XPX is the identity matrix I, times the magnitude, times a column vector D, okay, square brackets indicate a column vector, and a row vector P. Because if I have a column multiplied by a row, that gives me a 3 by 3 matrix. If I have a row multiplied by a column, it's, it's a scalar. Yeah? Can you see that? So if I take a column and multiply it by a row, then that will give me a 3 by 3 matrix, okay? And this is the magnitude. If I take the inverse of this, so 
that was my uh, matrix XPX. If I go backwards, anti shear, if you like, then that's the inverse. And that is simply I minus M into another parameter Q, uh, which you can easily derive by doing the inverse. And we have, again, a column matrix uh, times a row matrix, so it's a three by three. And I is a three by three identity matrix. Okay. It's just an economical way of expressing that matrix. Okay, I think this might be enough to absorb today, but I need to show you a little bit more mathematics in the next lecture. And you may be familiar in elasticity theory with eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Yeah, do you know what those are? Have you done elasticity at all? Okay, so these are just fancy names that mathematicians give okay, to vectors which are unchanged in direction by a strain tensor and an eigenvalue is how much are they distorted by the deformation. So vectors which do not change direction but they are changed in magnitude so the eigenvalue simply gives you the magnitude of the change in length which may be positive or negative. Okay? So we'll deal with that in the next lecture and also how we apply all this to, for example, rolling deformation, drawing, wire drawing, etc., or to phase transformations. Okay? Thank you.